Good evening, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> hello, 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 hello. How are you all? I hope you are well. Um, and trying to keep cool. Are you spending time in the fridge at the moment, or or are you um, are you just um, panting on the bed? I mean that in the nicest possible way as well. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> so so this person here who currently is trying to share the link to, to this live. Good evening, love. Good Hello. Evening. Cheers. This is Happy my husband. Holidays. This is my husband. This is this is Professor Richard Allen from the University of Reading. And and actually I we're in we're being total hypocrites at the moment, aren't we? Because we're on holiday in, in Puerto Ventura. Um, and I if you'd have been watching my live last week, you would have seen that I really had no clue whether we were going to make it or not because our son was was poorly and that needs to be in the other group in the other link as well sorry i'm just <laughs> i'm just giving in, giving him in instructions which other, which other one? i'll show you in a second right okay so welcome welcome to the weekly chin wag and uh, like i said so we are currently on holiday in Fuerteventura. ventura as I said, um, my poor boy, our poor boy last week had COVID and it wasn't until Sunday that we realised we were able able to go, able or able to come to, to on holiday. So so there you go. This 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 is what have you have you found the they found the link to send it to? Yeah, don't, I, don't, I don't know where to send it. Don't worry, I shall do that. Right. Okay. While while you're talking. This is what will happen, you see. Well, you've got to look at the thing because you've got a there you go. It's just talk. It's not done a live with me before. I have been on BBC. I know you have been. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. So actually, for those of you that know me, you may have actually or connected connected to me on Facebook. You may have actually seen me sharing a link, well, a photo of Rich on BBC News last uh was it Friday? Yeah, it was yeah. Friday, and then you were on the radio, weren't you? On on Saturday, don't you can talk now? I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, you're supposed to ask long. me some questions. I am going to ask you some questions. We're really good at bickering. <laughs> <laughs> We've been together a long time. I met him as a bass bass guitarist, believe it or not, in a in a band, weren't we? So yeah, so right, welcome, husband. Hi. Um, can you? introduce yourself and just give everybody a bit of a flavor about how you got into into climate change where how did it evolve what were your what were your kind of loves obviously i yep. know what was what were the things that you were in love with when you were young to get you get yep. you into it so snow so the the, the winter of 1981-82 was a really snowy winter so as a kid i guess i was about nine or something i was really into this snow and how how do they how do they forecast the snow um, so I was got really interested in the weather forecasts. Um, so I got interested in weather in that way. And then I suppose I also learned about the fact that the weather was very different 20,000 years ago. There was an ice age. Um, how did that happen? So, I, you know, I read a bit more and that's kind of how I got into it. So I knew that's what I wanted to do um, with, with my life, basically. So I, I, I learned also about the greenhouse effect in the 1980s. You know, there's acid rain, but also the greenhouse effect was the big thing back then. Um, and now, you know, then we knew what we kind of know now, except we know a lot more now. Okay. So I studied, you know, maths and physics and did environmental sciences, went on to do a PhD um, in Reading, um, where um, eventually I met my, my good lady wife here. Um, and then I, I, like I worked that. I, That's after good. that, yeah, good. <laughs> I, I worked for the Met Office for a bit. So obviously the Met Office has been crucial in the last few days what with the heat wave. And actually they were predicting a severe heat wave a week in advance. So models, you know, their prediction models, even though people might say they haven't, they've got a hell of a lot better. So like the, for example, the five day um, forecast um, now is as good as the three day forecast was 10 years ago. So, and the reason for that is, is they're continuously improving. So hey. exactly, I thought I'd drop that one in. They're continuously improving the physics, the physics that they write into millions of lines of computer code um, in these, and they run these, these, these simulations, these forecasts on supercomputers. They've got hugely, vastly better in the past 10, 20 years. And finally, there's much better observations that start off these simulations, mm. um, satellite data, um, ground-based. So all these things, you know, you know go into um, 
you know, the weather forecasts and making that better. But also, I was actually working with the Met Office doing climate research. Um, and then I moved back on to Reading and now where I am now as a prof doing climate change research. Exactly. So while we are over in um, in the Canaries, you guys, uh, we, we kind of came away, we left on, on um, Monday just before the, the kind of the heat wave hit, didn't we? On, on kind of on Monday afternoon, and everybody's been experiencing. Um, even even Michelle, I can see Michelle's on. Nice to see you guys. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I can see Michelle's on. I can see Andy Jacobs is on. Thank you very much for joining. Um, and hang on, who else? Oh, we've got Steph on as well. I can see. Let's see. Sorry, because normally I have my second. I have my second <laughs> screen, and I'm not used to having a really naff um, kind of webcam, which I have on my laptop. But anyway, so here we go. So we've got we've got a few people on. Um, Michelle, Steph, um, yeah, and Andy. So one thing actually before we kind of go into the heat wave, mm. Michelle is is basically saying so, we, and we've also got a question from Chris Hunter. Um, who I wanted to just, I wanted to kind of talk to you about that one in a minute. But Michelle is saying, let me just put this on screen because then hopefully you can see it. So this is Michelle. Acid rain <laughs> terrifies you from watching the X-Files. <clears throat> well, <laughs> what are your thoughts on acid rain, love? Well, it, it was it was a thing in the 1980s. If, yeah. if you're around then, you, you'll remember there was worries about acid rain, but that was actually burning fossil fuels also. Fossil fuels like coal have impurities like sulfur in. They created sulfur dioxide, which turned into an acid mm -hmm. in the air. Mm -hmm. So it was there was dieback of some trees in Scandinavia, for example. That's more or less been solved because of Clean Air Acts and things like that. So government um, action did actually um, remove the threat from acid rain back then. That's good. Mm -hmm. So no need to worry, Michelle. You're OK. <laughs> Even just stop watching the X-Files as well. Hang on a second. So I think this is Michelle as well. Sorry, it kind of mm -hmm. logged me in, logged me into. Um, so is that you that's saying this, Michelle? Yeah. Here we go. Past so the acid rain era. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You were born in 1985. Oh my God, you're such a yeah, baby. Just a baby. Oh, bless you. Now I am going to. Um, don't come. Don't come for me. Who is that? I can't see who's saying that. Hang on. It's not popped up on my screen yet. So whoever's, whoever's making that comment, I'm never going to... Oh, right. You're never going to stop watching the files. Maybe that was you, wasn't it, Michelle? I can see that. He's so weird having to see it on my phone. Yeah, that is you. You're never going to stop watching the X-Files. I did. I must admit, I was a big fan. I even got James, our son, into it. And we, we, watched, we watched it back for a little while and then we all got a bit bored. But there you go. <laughs> but there you go. So I'm going to grab this question from chris who he's he's also on holiday at the moment and where i'd ask people to kind of um add the question here we go so so um it's on it's below if anybody wants to see this and i can't share it on screen because it's not on this live um given given the slightly odd, odd transmission of the heat from spain and portugal to the uk via a low pressure in the bay of biscay do you think we could get 40 degrees from a high pressure just sat over the UK, not getting imported heat from Iberia? See, I'm, I'm not the only weather geek around here. I know. Chris is, a, Chris is a real weather geek. So so that's the other reason why I thought it was good to bring you on. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, heat waves, I mean, more broadly, they occur in summer when you get cloudless skies, a high pressure where the air is sinking and heating as it, as it sinks. Um, and that will give you hot weather. But as Chris mentions, there was a low pressure a, a weather system just to the west of Spain that kind of nudged even hotter air further north over us. So it kind of gave an extra an extra nudge mm. to the temperatures. And that's partly why we got such extreme temperatures as we did. But it's not the whole story because, um, of course, we shattered records. And the reason we shattered records was because of the added um, effect of greenhouse gas emissions which uh, humans have been through their activities have been emitting into the atmosphere since industrialization, mm. uh, you know, a couple of hundred years ago. And that's adding extra heat um, to the oceans and the atmosphere above them. Um, so that's adding extra higher temperatures, um, but it's also drying out soils as well. So a warmer atmosphere 
is actually more thirsty it can it's more mm -hmm. able to suck water mm -hmm. from the the ground in one region so one region will, will become ex more dry more scorched we've seen wildfires recently yeah. but the extra water that it sucks out the ground but out more out the ocean it then moves with the wind and can suck, uh, send that into storms as intense rain and you know we've also seen recently the the serious flooding we've had across the, the world so you get more intense rainfall and associated flooding but you also get more intense droughts and as we've seen more intense heat waves so um long answer short um at the moment we did need that extra kick of extra warm air so it was the weather patterns that, that produced the heat wave but climate change made it more intense in the future we probably won't even need that kick um, maybe in a few decades time we'll get these sorts of temperatures um, without that extra um, addition of heat um, from the south so yeah it'd be it's worrying if we do not meet our targets of getting towards net zero uh, emissions where are actually the emissions that are left over of carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere are balanced by what we're sucking into the ground essentially or into the oceans You've just answered some of my questions already. Well, that's all that's right. All right. Can make it quicker then, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> I can go off and drink my beer. <laughs> you can, no, you can have your beer here. Yeah, sure. But um, right, okay. So, so we'll skip to skip to that the question that I was going to say. So, what are the main what are the main things that we as individuals can do to reduce mm. emissions? Well, not go on holiday to Fuerteventura for a start. So, yeah, we have we have been scaling back our. Our holidays so we, well we've um, had no choice have we? we have had no choice but we're also you know not, you know not gonna it's not everyone's right to you know fly off to the other mm -hmm. side of the world is it but mm -hmm. um yeah individuals can um do small things um change their diets to a less carbon intensive diets so moving away from red meats particularly plant-based diets um change the way they travel uh, walk and cycle if you can rather than get you know use a car um fly less or not at all if possible mm. um but there's a famous quote that that kind of says um if we all do a little bit we'll achieve a little bit so individuals doing things it's kind of framed in the wrong way it's about societies changing the way they live their lives and the only way you can do that is is collaboration that's through um, individuals doing their bit um local groups so you know i'm part of reading hydro and the, the local litter picking group, for example, local groups are important, but crucially also um, large organisations. Um, University of Reading uh, have got their strong uh, net zero targets and they're doing quite a lot. Cities or towns like Reading, um, where we live, um, they've got quite um, a, a good action plan towards getting to net zero, aside from government. Um, but also it comes down to the end of the day, it's crucial that governments are cooperating and all working towards one collective goal because it's a global problem. We need the, you know, the governance to help everyone because people are worried about paying their mortgage every month. They're worried about other things and living their life. Um, we need help to actually move, you know, change the way we live our lives so we can reduce our carbon emissions. So Michelle is actually saying, do you know what? And I totally get this. She says, my, sus my husband, I can't even speak, my husband and I dream of a cabin in the middle of nowhere, living off the land, we're not hustle and bustle people, all, you're all about nature. Yeah, I mean, I think, to be honest, for, for us, we've been trying to do things, haven't we? I mean, you obviously, you do so much more than me. I wrote, I wrote a blog recently on um, the electric vehicle um, infrastructure because I find I, I I know that now that we're back to um, you know everybody's we've come out of the, the other side of the pandemic we're back driving again I'm back driving again I'm not driving in half as much as I used to do because I recognize that actually I quite like working from home and it's not it's not impossible yeah in a second um, it's it's not impossible for people to work from home now because of the fact that that we can we can work from home but actually you know kind of about the the electric vehicle and infrastructure but you saw you and um so you and our son james you went to the smart cities um exhibition a few years ago didn't you and there was there was some stuff in there about the way that we'd probably be sharing cars was that right yeah so it, it, getting away from the fact that everyone has the right to have a car we need a, need to be in our little shell it's more 
you know, if I need to get from A to B, let's put that in and, that, and, and the system will give you uh, an opportunity of how you do that yeah. right, in the best possible way, I guess. I'm just going to put this because I know you spotted this as well. I'm going to put this on screen now. I know this is mm. from this is from you, Steph, because it'll come up as Facebook think, view that you. Yeah, it's, so. a very, it's a good point. Yeah. Exactly. So, so Steph's saying, what is, what good is it for us to panic about it all when other countries mm. are not interested? We reduced massively CO two when China pump out a third of the world's pollution. And yes, I know you're controversial, darling, but that's what it's all about. And actually, if you can answer. Yeah. Your thoughts so on this. Um, actually, China is doing quite a lot um, to reduce its emissions because it knows that climate change is, is seriously affecting its population. Obviously, they've got quite a different mode of government in China, but you know, it's still a serious concern to them. Um, pollution in cities, but also extreme flooding, extreme heat waves. They've also been um, receding. So actually, China are doing quite a lot. They could do more. Maybe the reason, you know, the reason they're emitting quite so much is that they've got a third of the world's population living there. So of course they're going to be emitting a lot of emissions, but per person they're emitting much, much less than us. Mm. So um, you're right, though. Um, it's got it's got to be a, a global collective um, action, and that's why you know intergovernmental organisations are important in you know bringing this cooperation across different countries. And when you were working on the IPCC, you saw a lot of that, didn't you? But you did. So Rich was involved in in writing a, a new chapter, wasn't it, for the for the IPCC? So for those of you that don't know what the IPCC is, it's the Intergovernmental Panel on on Climate Change. So Rich was involved in in kind of writing this this new chapter, and and at the end of it, there was a lot there was a lot of controversy and a lot of. Um, what would you say, kind of going through everything, you went everything, everything had to be signed off line by line and the different countries that were having to sign it all off, that was that was quite a big thing, wasn't it? So the IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And so yeah, I was working on that with scientists from around the world, um, coming out with a report over three and a half years, um, the state of the art knowledge of the science of climate change, which was my area. There's another section looking at adaptation. So we know we're going to have to adapt to climate change, like we've seen with this heat wave. We've got to change infrastructure so we can live in a hotter world, for example. Yeah. And finally, mitigation of climate change, which is what um, Steph is alluding to earlier and others, that you know we've got to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. How do we get from where we are now to net zero? So um, what was crucial in that is that you know you work as like a marathon over three and a half years to come up with the latest science and then you have to agree the summary for policymakers word by word with government represent government rep delegates essentially and the reason why that's important is that the governments have basically bought into this they've signed up to the wording that's written in these reports so even though things were watered down a bit rather than phase out coal for example was watered down by the indian delegation to phase down which to me, it didn't mean it's that a bit much. Woolly, isn't it? Yeah, really? but nevertheless, without this um, collaboration and cooperation, um, and the fact that they've they've signed up for this process, you, you we wouldn't be um, getting the progress we are getting to. You know, we're not like like as has been mentioned. You know, the progress isn't certainly not good enough. China is still building coal-fired power stations, but it's also investing massively in solar power, hydro power. Um, you know, it's well ahead of us in terms of solar in a lot of regions. Mm. So um, Carbon Brief, for example, is a very good site to look at in terms of you know, what is the energy situation in terms of country by country. But this IPCC process, that, that nearly derailed our holidays. Uh, it did last years, year, didn't it? Was ago. it last year as well? Was it last, no, last year? It was year, last year, were, yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. it was... Which was involved in all of that right at the end, and that mm. was it was a very very stressful. But, time, but it did it? did show as well that you can do a lot without travelling. So the first meeting was in China, um, next one France. Got a train, so that wasn't too bad. But um, <laughs> yeah, that's all, another story. All the others were, um, you know, we did it virtually. We could do it virtually. Mm. So much can be done virtually. Because um, it did seem quite ironic that all these all these climate change scientists were all heading together. Yeah, to actually, to actually, to one, you know, one place where you could have actually, but people weren't doing things virtually. Well, well actually, then. actually, but I mean, in some sense, to work on such a big project, you do need, need to that face-to-face. -face. Yeah, I and mean, you probably have it in, in in business as well. Like, you know, 
there's certain things, even if it's going for a meal with people in the evening and getting to know and breaking, you know, yeah. breaking the ice, building bonds with people, building building trust. These are hugely important um, issues. So it's never going to be that we can do everything virtually in the way it's done now. Yeah. Maybe maybe there will be other better ways of doing virtual where we will feel like we can, you know. Share a, share a drink in the evening. And, uh, <laughs> That's what he's trying to do. Yeah. Um, I can also see that Carol Devenny was watching earlier. I don't know whether he's still on now, Carol, watching. And I will share the comments that are coming up as well, by the way. But I was going to say, so I actually had an in-person day with Carol Devenny, as you know, in, in London. And when exactly what you're saying it made so much difference. I mean, I did actually get the train, just to say. <laughs> um, well, you didn't fly. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, fully enough, it was half an hour on the train. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, so it does make a difference, doesn't it, when you actually have that, when you have that time in, you know, in person. Oh, you are still there. Hi, Carol. Thank you for joining us. But, you know, actually having that face-to-face -face time, I've kind of had two or three things. And, but this is where, for me, I find it quite difficult because there are certain places that it's really difficult to get to them by train. You know, and and things like that. Well, it, all right, it's in certain places. Well, look at look at got even to, got to Lisbon. I know. just about. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but like you say, that said, that I'll bring you on another time for that story. My goodness me. So, what is that? The Uber is that the paying two hundred and fifty quid for an Uber, well, whatever it was. Well, ironically, because flooding stopped the line between Paris and uh, Hendai. <laughs> but how much did you have to pay? Well, as much as the it train. Was about about, yeah, so. about 200 quid. I got to the meeting. You did get to the meeting. That was that was quite an interesting time, wasn't it? Um, so we've got, hang on, let me just see if I can actually go up a little bit. Like I say, excuse me, guys, um, because I have normally got a second um, a second screen. So this is what this is what Michelle was saying. Problem being, it's so hard to find land because council, government, etc. Don't don't truly support it. I guess that's most most of the problem. Um, and we've got so and this is where steph was talking about the coal powered coal power 20 plus coal power stations which we've mentioned this is chris okay so chris is saying i'm reading letters by pavel's i've got to pronounce this pavel florensky currently he was, he was a leader in Russia on perm in the 1930s. The frost is melting, and in Siberia, there's already huge craters forming. The methane being released there is dwarfing CO2 releases in terms of impact. How on earth do we counter that? China are actually more proactive than Russia, but where is Siberia? Yeah. Thoughts? So, yeah, I mean, the, the methane problem, you know, what we've seen with methane concentrations in the atmosphere there, they're rising, they, they kind of stabilized at maybe 10 years ago, and now they're back rising again. Some, some of this relates to leakage of gas, for, which is used to power, but um, there is also the possibility that Chris raises that um, the warmer soils melt, melts the permafrost and methane is released from this permafrost into the atmosphere. Methane is a far stronger greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. But there's less of it in the atmosphere mm -hmm. so you know it has a very su substantial impact on um climate change but not as big as carbon dioxide but still a big one at the moment the scientific evidence suggests that this big extra emission from the permafrost isn't isn't being detected so far but it's not to say it couldn't happen in, in the future um there's small uh, incidents of these you know these sinkholes and, and the these bubbling of methane from um, once frozen areas, but mm. it's not yet been, as far as the scientific evidence shows, it's not really been seen to be a, a huge issue at the moment, but it is potentially could be. So I just wanted to put this up on screen as well, because Carol works in the railways as well. She works in the wet railway infrastructure <laughs> and she says she's building railways as fast as she can. Yeah, and, and they've got to be Thank built you. to built to withstand heat waves now, haven't they? With yeah. buckling rails. Like yeah. the fret the, the Europeans obviously they're used to higher temperatures, they treat their steel beforehand so that it doesn't buckle. Whereas obviously mm. we we've got Victorian um stock, haven't we? I guess high, high speed two is gonna be um Climate proof, I would hope. But. Carol, any comment? <laughs> HS2, thoughts? <laughs> so hang on, we've got as well. So I think this is Steph. Steph, I'm just going to show this on screen. So Steph's saying, um, I watched something on Discovery the other night and have read up on it too. It was the NASA Grace Project, which me measured that the disappearance or use 
of water equivalent to one Lake Erie every two years in India. And, and the colossal amount of concrete poured across China has altered the mass distribution of Earth and affected its wobble. Is there a case that increase in wobble puts us slightly nearer the equator occasionally? I mm -hmm. don't doubt that some climate change is happening, but I'm not sold on it just being carbon dioxide. So, I mean, the short answer to that is Oof. no, is, Oof, is well, so GRACE satellite is an amazing satellite. I think it's, it's finished now, but I think there's a replacement. So it's two satellites following each other um, in quick succession. When they go over something that's a bit ma more massive, like a huge ice sheet, um, the first one will accelerate a bit relative to the other. And the slight differences between the satellites tell you if there's more mass there or less. So year on year, you can tell if there's an ice sheet is melting. But you can also, like Steph says, you can um, detect if there's less water um, in, a, in an area because there'll be less mass than uh, that's being taken out. So that's being, being used and that, that's really interesting. In terms of um, the changing the wobble, I'm sure that was such a minuscule effect that it wouldn't have, it's more of a scientific interest thing mm -hmm. rather than affecting anything. Uh, it really wouldn't wouldn't change. You might be able to detect slight changes in wobble or even rotation rate of the Earth, but it's so tiny it wouldn't affect anything to do with us. The science is clear that the primary driver of, of warming of climate is carbon dioxide emissions, closely followed by methane emissions. Land use change has an effect as well, deforestation, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Those are the primary drivers. Thousands of scientists from across the world have, have, have been done studies into this um you know this is the primary um reason that the planet is warming up do you know i've realized i'm sat here listening to you and i'm not smiling i usually just sit and smile and listen to whoever i'm sorry i'm just listening to you avidly darling well you just have such a miserable guest <laughs> person, that's really not true <laughs> that's really not true so we've got so um like i say sorry everybody it's still showing facebook user it's really annoying on melon but yeah. it's a great system so carol is actually saying so we've been writing rewriting specs for rail for extreme climate for the last year uh, 10 years so perfect and she's also saying hs2 being being high speed means it's built to a high half far higher spec than domestic rail so yeah absolutely good to, good to know that and actually you had an encounter with hs2 last year didn't you love <laughs> well yeah though, i was going on a walk with my son well with james and uh yeah so we we uh the, the road was blocked off and i thought well we'll be able to get past but of course we we reached these huge um gates and fences and you know it was basically a um a ventilation duct where where the hs2 goes underneath the chilterns um, so yeah, we've got uh, a guy with a hard. A guy with a hard. I thought I could sneak around this farmer's field, but this guy <laughs> with a hard hat jumped out from behind a bush and told us to get off, get off their land. Get off my <laughs> land! I don't know. Did he say it like that? No, I'm not he sure. didn't. Get off my land. No. Well, look, it's it's we we are we are as as I've said, I've been told off by numerous people for working whilst I've been on holiday, including him um so so we're only here for kind of i'll be i'll be back we'll be back home by what in the next wednesday's um chimweg anyway so i i'm going to sign off in a second and actually it's just lovely to come on here tut tut who's saying tut tut <laughs> i can't see yeah. i bet oh yeah yeah michelle is one of those people who's been telling me <laughs> hang on a second Hang on, I crew. can see. Oh, yeah. So being a crew last, oh yes. Crew, crew is an amazing junction. <laughs> right, well, I'll just show the show. So yes, yeah, so, um, this is Chris saying, very interesting. Thank you very much, Chris. Good question, Chris. And yes, thank you. <laughs> I tell you, I need, I think I need to bring him to the farm shop next time, don't I, rather than me. And no. I'll just walk off and let you two talk about climate. So, <laughs> it's too expensive, that farm shop. So <laughs> yeah, how much How much was the thing you were trying not to buy, Chris? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so, and yeah, and so Steph's saying, being a crew last, she's waiting for HS2 to get there. Is that the bit that's actually been signed off or the bit that's not going to happen, the crew? section it's a, bit up, a bit. bit up towards leeds isn't, isn't it isn't that isn't it isn't that, that bit that's cancelled? actually been cancelled now no sorry carol if we don't if we're totally um oblivious to that you've Bur probably put a lot of work into bit. it as well yeah so but listen i i would just like to say thank you um i think i'm going to actually go on holiday now <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and, and just do a bit of chilling out because for all of you guys that know me, um, I've really needed this and he's new, he's really needed this. We've been totally shattered. So hang on. So Steph is just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you ever come on to come to crew on the train, <laughs> best advice I can give is stay on the train. Crew HS2 is confirmed to go ahead. Oh, is it? So I think I may have been, do you know, yeah, I might have actually been out. Sorry, I might have had an ex-boyfriend in crew at some point. So, but hey, there you go. Don't forget I'm a Yorkshire lass originally. And we it wasn't that far away. It, it was in the car in the car anyway right i'm gonna go now and we're gonna do some really sustainable things like walking and getting buses and just and enjoying the sunshine so look i hope it all calms down for you all i hope uh michelle i hope your dogs are okay and uh and they're keeping cool um because hasn't the temperature dropped a bit today because we're kind of about a day behind with them um, we've got kind of youtube on the tv and it's kind of talk about wildfires from yesterday which were a bit shocking but listen, everybody, have a wonderful rest of the week. Try, try and enjoy the rest of it. And I shall see you this time next week. Thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you. See you guys. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.